Bill Donahue talks about the secret links between the Bible and the pineal gland. He shows us how old knowledge connects with the deep parts of the brain. In Genesis 32, 30, Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, and I will call the place pineal. How can you not see that? The pineal gland of the brain, which is, stimulates the right hemisphere of the brain to open up that which is God's dwelling place to you. The holy place is at the right side. That's why Jesus said, cast your net to the right side and you'll get fish. That's why the ancients said that you direct the energy to the right hemisphere of the brain by activating the pineal. When you rise up those steps of Kundalini, you activate the right side of the brain. Brain cells come alive that you hadn't even used before, and that's why Paul said, I have the mind of Christ, because that's Christ consciousness. The ancients believed that there is a part of your body that connects to the symbolism of Lamb, or Aries, and that part is the pineal gland of the brain. Jesus called it the single eye. As you know, when the sun enters Aries in the springtime, that's when the springtime comes, but the sun must enter an intercourse with the Lamb of God, or Aries, before spring can come. The ancients also said that there is a part of your body that connects to what is called the symbolism of the lamb or Aries, and that part is the pineal or pineal gland of the brain. The King James Version of the English Bible text reads, The light of the body is the eye. If, therefore, thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The World English Bible translate the passage as, The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. Bill Donahue believes the single eye is the brain's pineal gland. There are seven main chakras from the base of your spine to the crown of your head. Chakras provide subtle energy that helps your organs, mind, and intellect work at their best level. The seven churches of Revelation are related to the seven psychic centers, or chakras, with the teachings given to each church relating to the consciousness and activity at that level. Chakras start at the sacrum, then go up to the sexual prostate area, to the solar plexus, to the heart, to the throat, to the head, and then to the pineal gland of the brain or the Lamb of God. Through meditation, one can climb up these chakras or seals as as said in the book of Revelation, and raised to the brain's pineal gland, which in turn, the energy from the meditation would like that, which is the right hemisphere or the eastern sky. If you take this and look at this astronomically, that's exactly what happens. Because by the crucifixion of the flesh, Jesus Christ rises up and sits at the right hand of the Father. After the Son on December the 21st enters into the constellation of the Southern Cross, crucifixion, it sits three days, three nights in the tomb of the earth, which is the solstice, then through the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin constellation, it rises out on December the 25th up to the Lamb or Aries and then sits in the uh, northern sky, sits at the eastern uh, side or the right hemisphere, and summer comes to the earth. Donahue explains that astronomically, the sun's movement reflects the story of Jesus Christ. For instance, on December 21st, the sun aligns with the Southern Cross constellation, symbolizing Christ's crucifixion. This alignment coincides with the winter solstice when the sun appears to sit still for three days like Christ's time in the tomb. Then as the sun moves through the constellation of Virgo, it rises on December 25th, paralleling Christ's resurrection. This alignment continues as the sun moves into Aries representing the Lamb and brings summer to the earth. This correlation highlights the connection between the life of Jesus Christ, the sun's movement, and the symbolism in these constellations. Christian theology often associates the Lamb's book of life with salvation and eternal life. The names of those who will inherit eternal life are believed to be written in this book. The Lamb symbolically aligns with Aries, a constellation in astrology, which in turn is connected to the brain's pineal gland. Activating the pineal gland is described as raising the seven chakras through meditation. Chakras are energy centers in the body according to Hindu and Buddhist traditions. Activating the brain's right hemisphere is associated with creativity, intuition, and spirituality, which is crucial in this process. Now, I'm going to show you how little most mainline Christian people understand when they say, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If we are taking the premise that the Lamb is Aries, which is connected or symbol of the pineal gland of the brain, and that in order to activate that or have that intercourse with that Lamb, we must rise up the seven chakras through meditation, 
and then sit at the right hand or activate the right hemisphere of the brain. In order to activate the right hemisphere of the brain mystically, we must climb those seven chakras or seven seals which are located within you and on the back at the spine. The right hand of the one sitting on the throne in Revelation 5.1 represents the activation of the brain's right hemisphere which is linked to higher consciousness and spiritual enlightenment. John presents the seven sealed book in Revelation 5.1 and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. That's the description of the Lamb's Book of Life. It's in the right hand, that means it's the right hemisphere of the brain, a book written within, within you. Remember Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is within you. Okay. On the backside, that connects it to the seven chakras which rise up to the spine, the seven seals, sealed with seven seals which identifies the seven chakras. The Lamb's Book of Life connects the seven chakras and spiritual salvation. Donahue says that many Christians are unaware of this interpretation implying that their spiritual standing may be compromised as a result. When the text mentions a name, it is not referring to a literal name but instead to a path or way of living which holds significance in mysticism. Jesus' is real name was Joshua. If you were to call Jesus by his name during his time in the Holy Land, he wouldn't respond because that wasn't the name he was known by. Praying in Jesus' name may not be effective if you're not using his actual name, but praying in Jesus' name means following his teachings and way of life. Who's Jesus? If you saw Jesus in the Holy Land during the time when he was physically alive and you called him Jesus, he'd never turn around because that wasn't his name anyhow. So if you ask something in his name, at least if you're going to say that it's the proper name, you should use this right name, don't you think? No wonder they don't get their prayers answered. They're asking the wrong guy. A verse from the Bible, Matthew 6, 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. This verse speaks metaphorically about the importance of having a clear and virtuous vision or perception as it affects one's entire being. It emphasizes maintaining spiritual clarity and righteousness in one's actions and thoughts. A single eye refers to the pineal gland in the brain. This gland produces melatonin associated with light, symbolizing spiritual enlightenment. Sitting in the right hand of the Father symbolizes the brain's right hemisphere. Jesus' statement that the kingdom of God is within you implies an internal source of spiritual knowledge. Joshua went around the world seven times and a wall fell, which is mysticism. The wall falling symbolizes breaking through mental barriers to reach a higher consciousness. It's the wall that keeps you from the freedom of your higher mind. And when you match those seven seals, you're going around the wall seven times. And that's when it will fall. And of course, we understand that mounting these seven, it's the same as Joshua going around the wall of Jer Do you honestly believe there was a guy that went around the wall seven times and the wall fell down? That's mysticism. It's mythology. It's talking about spiritual things. It's the wall that keeps you from the freedom of your higher mind. And when you mount those seven seals, you're going around the wall seven times, and that's when it'll fall down. There is a similarity between the right hemisphere and the temple. It references teachings from Jesus and the Apostle Paul who associated individuals with temples. The temple G refers to the brain's right hemisphere beside the head behind the eyes. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 12 and 13, Jesus entered the temple court and drove out all buying and selling there. He overturned the money changers' tables and the benches of those selling doves. He said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you you are making it a den of robbers. Jesus driving out the money changers from the temple symbolizes removing negative or distracting thoughts from one's mind. It's about cleansing the mind of harmful influences or disruptive thinking patterns. In 1 Kings chapter 6, Jesus Christ talked about the importance of inner silence and meditation. He said, take no thought. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. It means centering your attention inward, away from distractions, casting your net to the right side the narrow way means directing your energy towards inner spiritual growth. Entering within when you pray in the closet and close the door means finding a quiet space for prayer or meditation where no one can be distracted by the external world. It helps one to focus solely on the inner spiritual experience. It lets you stay relaxed and experience deeper concentration, introspection and connection with your inner self or higher power without getting disrupted by the outside environment. Jesus emphasized that true spiritual development occurs in moments of absolute silence. This silence allows for a connection with higher states of consciousness and a sense of inner peace and harmony. All of those things mean that 
you must be in quiet meditation where there is no human thought. Above the thoughts of the mind, you must find a place of bliss, of nirvana, of absolute silence. The construction of your temple then must be in silence. It cannot be with prayer. It cannot be with going to church. It cannot be with reading a Bible. It cannot be any way but absolute silence where there is no thought. In 1 Kings verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul stated, You are the temple. It indicates that the temple was constructed in silence. There was no noise from using hammers, axes, or any other tools during its construction. This silence during the building process suggests that the temple within oneself is also created in silence, devoid of external disturbances. Entering a state of inner silence and peace is highly necessary for spiritual growth. Jesus said, Take no thought which meant free yourself from the constant chatter of your minds. It indicates the single eye and focus on inner vision and intuition. Paul's claim that you are the temple means that our bodies are sacred spiritual transformation vessels. However, this transformation can only occur when the mind is free from the noise of worldly thoughts. According to Paul, the human mind, driven by its carnal desires and distractions, is at odds with the divine. This idea is expressed in Romans 8, 7, where Paul describes the carnal mind as an enemy of God. In 1 Kings 6, 8, a symbolic connection is made to the brain's right hemisphere. Donahue says that these interpretations make sense. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 24, the apostle Paul states, these things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. The Apostle Paul refers to elements of the Old Testament as symbolic. An allegory is a literary device where events represent deeper spiritual meanings. So when we read about temples or structures in the Bible, it's not just about physical buildings. It's about understanding the spiritual truths they represent within ourselves. Bill Donahue further explains that if the temple was constructed in silence, which signifies meditation, then what about the brain's right hemisphere? Why was the entrance to the holy place placed on the right side of the structure. Why not the left or downstairs? This suggests a more profound meaning, indicating the significance of the right hemisphere. When we engage in meditation, we overcome obstacles represented by the seven seals and activate the brain's right hemisphere. This practice stimulates inactive brain cells, leading to heightened awareness. This is why Paul stated, I have the mind of Christ, referring to a state of elevated consciousness similar to Christ's. Don't you understand when the sun in December comes out of the winter solstice, it rises up and then sits at the right side. And what happens when the sun sits at the right side in April and May and June? Summer comes. The same thing that happens outside, which is the macrocosm, happens inside. And when your energy moves to the right side, summer comes to your life. Everything that has been dormant, everything that has been dead, comes back to life. So the sun's movement in December and its association with the winter solstice holds symbolic significance. As it rises and shifts to the right side, mirroring the cycle observed in nature, it matches an internal transformation. When our energy aligns with this metaphorical shift to the right side, like the sun's movement, it represents a period of transformation. Just as nature experiences a resurgence in spring, our lives too witness a revival. Inactive aspects of ourselves awaken and what seems lifeless is infused with vitality once more. In mysticism, winding stairs symbolize kundalini, a potent force believed to be activated through meditation. It's often depicted as a troublemaker, much like the caduceus seen on medical symbols. This imagery represents the ascent of energy within oneself, like climbing stairs, through the practice of meditation. If we look at the structure of DNA, its genetic makeup resembles the winding motion of stairs similar to the concept of kundalini. This ancient idea of the coiled traitor represents weak energy to the winding path of stairs. As this energy symbolized by kundalini rises upward, it traverses through the seven seals and ascends into the brain spinal gland. This imagery of ascending with winding stairs is reflected in spiritual texts. For instance, it describes kundalini ascending to the right side, reaching the middle chamber and ultimately ascending to the third level of consciousness. In the second 
second epistle of Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 2 of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul shares an intriguing account of what seems to be an out-of-body experience. He describes a man who, 14 years ago, had an experience where he couldn't differentiate between whether he was in his physical body or not. This experience led him into a trance, a state of deep meditation. The man seemed to transcend his physical form, entering a higher state of consciousness. He refers to this elevated realm as the third heaven. We find a correlation if we connect this to the symbolism of the temple described in First Kings. The temple constructed in silence represents the practice of meditation. Jesus encouraged meditation by focusing on the mind's eye, symbolized by the single eye. The temple's sanctity is associated with the right side, mirroring the importance of directing energy to the brain's right hemisphere. This aligns with the concept of Kundalini, a spiritual energy believed to rise through the body, activating higher consciousness. The holy place is at the right side. That's why Jesus said, cast your net to the right side and you'll get fish. That's why the ancients said that you direct the energy to the right hemisphere of the brain by activating the pineal when you rise up those steps of Kundalini on this, and overcome the seven seals. It goes up with winding stairs, which is the circular force of Kundalini, the coiled serpent, out to the third heaven. So when the Apostle Paul speaks of ascending with winding stairs, he describes the ascent of Kundalini energy, overcoming the seven seals and reaching the third heaven, signifying a profound spiritual awakening and union with divine consciousness. The term third heaven holds symbolic significance rooted in Greek understanding. Heaven doesn't refer to a physical location, but represents different levels of consciousness. In Greek philosophy, the hierarchy of consciousness is depicted in five degrees. The first is associated with earth, representing the most basic level of awareness. The second is water, signifying a deeper understanding. The third degree, often referred to as air, represents a heightened state of consciousness where one transcends mere physical existence and delves into deeper spiritual awareness. When the scripture speaks of rising to meet Jesus in the air, it's not about physically ascending through the sky, but it symbolizes an inner journey towards enlightenment, rising above the limitations of the mind's thoughts and ego. The concept of rising within oneself to a higher realm of consciousness is what's referred to as rapture. It's a concept not exclusive to Christianity, but also found in Buddhist teachings, denoting a profound spiritual awakening. So when the Apostle Paul mentions ascending to the third heaven, it signifies a deep spiritual experience where one connects with divine consciousness. This journey occurs within our own temple, representing our consciousness primarily when cultivated through practice is like meditation. By directing our energy to the brain's right hemisphere, activating kundalini energy and overcoming internal barriers, we ascend to higher levels of awareness, ultimately experiencing a profound union with the divine. And so here, the Apostle Paul went up into the third heaven, and we understand that we get there in our temple, which is our consciousness, when we are in silence of meditation, directing our energy to the right hemisphere. The Kundalini activates up the seven seals of the winding stairs, taking us up into the holy place and out into the third, which is air, or the third stage of consciousness, is where you see God face to face. In the next few minutes, I will show you how to fully decalcify your pineal gland. What's more, in the next few seconds, I will show you a video with Santo Bonacci that will help you understand the importance of your pineal gland. You'll be amazed by this analogy. Let's watch this video and then I will explain in detail the whole process of awakening and what exactly you need to do. I'll tell you how you were programmed in your first seven years of life, how to erase bad programs from your subconscious mind and how to reprogram your subconscious to get exactly what you want without struggle which is probably the opposite to what you're used to. Now, pay attention to this video. The pineal gland is the third eye. When you read the story of Pinocchio, Pinocchio has two words, pine, P-I-N, pineal gland, and occhio is ocula. Occhio, in Italian, is eye. That's why you go to an oculist. So Pinocchio means the pineal gland. So Pinocchio is a puppet. He's not a real person. In order to become a real person, to ascend, you have to activate your pineal gland. You have to stop telling lies. As everyone sees your nose grow every time you tell a lie. You have to stop being deceived by your friends. 
You have to stop going to the circuses and the shows, as all the philosophers have ever said. Getting drunk, intoxicated with drugs, and to be sober. So the pineal gland is the third eye, and it's our highest consciousness. So if you want to be real, just read the story of Pinocchio and activate your Pinocchio. This tiny, pine cone shaped organ has intrigued both scientists and spiritual seekers. Located deep within the brain, it secretes melatonin and regulates sleep patterns. But to mystics and philosophers, the pineal gland is a third eye, a spiritual organ providing perception beyond ordinary sight. Ancient civilizations like the Egyptians symbolized it through the eye of Horus, a mystical emblem of enlightenment and insight. Now, consider Pinocchio, the wooden puppet manipulated by strings. These strings can be seen as the limitations of human consciousness, tied to physical senses and societal norms. In the story, Pinocchio yearns for freedom and transformation, much like the human soul aims for higher states of consciousness. The character of the blue fairy in Pinocchio's tale can be interpreted as a divine intervention or spiritual guide that helps us activate our pineal gland. She sets Pinocchio on a path to becoming real, which can be equated with awakening one's inner sight or third eye. Just as Pinocchio needs to demonstrate moral integrity to become a real boy, spiritual practices like meditation, ethical living and mindfulness are often recommended for activating the pineal gland. Pinocchio's notorious growing nose when he lies can also be symbolically linked to the concept of illusion that clouds our real vision. When we are not truthful to ourselves or live in ignorance, our inner sight, or third eye, remains dormant, much like Pinocchio remaining wooden and lifeless. The act of lying can be likened to the calcification of the pineal gland, a condition that many believe hampers its proper function. As Pinocchio learns to navigate moral complexities, he inches closer to becoming a real boy. A real boy. Similarly, as we rid ourselves of the illusions that bind us, we get closer to activating our pineal gland and opening our third eye. Once this transformation is complete, both Pinocchio and the individual attain a state of freedom and higher understanding. This image shows us how a calcified pineal gland looks. The calcification is a process where calcium phosphate crystals accumulate in the gland, potentially affecting its function. Several factors contribute to this phenomenon, and it is often linked to modern lifestyle choices and environmental factors. One of the most discussed contributors is fluoride, a compound found in many public water supplies and dental products. Fluoride has a high affinity for the pineal gland and can accumulate there over time. Studies have shown that this accumulation may lead to the formation of calcium phosphate crystals contributing to calcification. Diet is another significant factor. Consumption of processed foods that are high in preservatives, additives and refined sugar can increase the level of toxins. These toxins may contribute to calcification by causing inflammation and oxidative stress, creating an environment where calcium deposits are more likely to form. Additionally, exposure to heavy metals such as lead, mercury and cadmium can contribute to pineal gland calcification. These metals are often found in air pollution, fish, and even some dental fillings. Once they enter the body, they can be stored in various tissues, including the pineal gland, where they may interact with calcium and other minerals to form deposits. Age also plays a role in calcification. As people grow older, the rate of calcification tends to increase, although the reason for this correlation is not entirely clear. Hormonal changes and longer exposure to contributing factors could be potential explanations. Other lifestyle choices, such as excessive alcohol consumption and tobacco use, may also facilitate calcification. Both of these substances can cause inflammation and oxidative stress, which can lead to an environment conducive to calcium deposits. Some medications, particularly antacids and certain types of antibiotics that are high in calcium, aluminium and other minerals, 
may also contribute to calcification when taken in excess or for extended periods. Fluorine's role in the pineal gland's calcification has been a subject to concern and study. In the United States, fluoride is added to public water supplies as a measure to promote dental health. This fluoridated water is often provided in schools, exposing children to fluoride from a young age. While the intention behind water fluoridation is to reduce tooth decay, its effects on the other parts of the body, including the pineal gland, are not fully understood and are subject of ongoing research. Fluoride has a strong affinity for calcified tissues and the pineal gland being a calcifying tissue, readily absorbs and stores fluoride. Over time, the accumulation of fluoride can facilitate the formation of calcium phosphate crystals within the gland contributing to calcification. This is particularly concerning for children whose pineal glands are still in the developmental stage. Early onset of calcification could theoretically impact the gland's future functionality, although more research is needed to fully understand these implications. In animal studies, High levels of fluoride exposure have been linked to altered melatonin production and other hormonal changes which are primarily regulated by the pineal gland. If similar effects occur in humans, this could have a cascade of impact from disrupted sleep patterns to affecting various biological processes regulated by melatonin. The potential risks have led some experts and advocacy groups to question the widespread use of fluoridated water, particularly in schools where children are still developing. While dental organizations generally support water fluoridation for its benefits in reducing tooth decay, the practice remains controversial due to the concerns about its systemic effect including potential pineal gland calcification. It's worth noting that not all research confirms a direct link between fluoride and pineal gland calcification, and the topic is the subject of ongoing debate in the scientific community. However, the concern over the additive effects of lifelong exposure beginning in childhood continues to be a point of discussion. One of the most prominent symptoms is disrupted sleep patterns. The pineal gland is responsible for producing melatonin, a hormone that regulates sleep. Calcification could potentially reduce the gland's ability to produce this hormone, leading to insomnia, frequent waking during the night, or irregular sleep cycles. Another symptom is a decline in cognitive functions like memory, focus, and attention. Though research on this topic is limited, the pineal gland has been thought to play a role in cognitive health. Calcification could potentially interfere with the gland's ability to contribute to neurotransmitter balance, affecting your mental clarity. Mood swings and depressive symptoms could also signal issues with the pineal gland. Reduced melatonin production may not only affect sleep, but also contribute to mood imbalances as melatonin interacts with serotonin, another neurotransmitter responsible for regulating mood. Fatigue and low energy levels are also commonly reported symptoms because the pineal gland plays a role in regulating circadian rhythms. Calcification could disrupt these natural cycles, leading to a constant feeling of tiredness or lack of energy. Reduced intuition or difficulty in making decisions may also be indicative. In esoteric traditions, the pineal gland, or third eye, is considered the center of intuition and foresight. While this is less studied in the scientific community, many people who undergo processes to decalcify the pineal gland report increased intuitive abilities. Physical symptoms like headaches and migraines could also be linked. The pineal gland is located near severe nerve pathways and its calcification could potentially cause or exacerbate headaches. Here are some commonly recommended ways to decalcify the pineal gland. One of the simplest steps you can take is to drink filtered water that removes fluoride and other harmful chemicals. This can reduce the accumulation of substances that contribute to calcification. Consuming organic foods rich in antioxidants can help counteract the effects of calcification. Foods rich in essential nutrients like vitamin K2, magnesium and iodine can be particularly helpful. Some people use natural supplements like chlorella, spirulina, and wheatgrass to aid in decalcification. These supplements are believed to detoxify the body and may help in breaking down calcium phosphate. Processed foods 
often contain additives and preservatives that contribute to calcification. Cutting them out of your diet can be beneficial. Using fluoride-free toothpaste and mouthwash can also reduce your exposure. If you live in an area where the water supply is fluoridated, consider using a water filtration system that removes fluoride. Both substances can contribute to pineal gland calcification, so reducing or eliminating them can help in decalcification. Though less scientifically supported, many believe that spiritual practices like meditation and yoga can help in activating the pineal gland and might aid in its decalcification. Some people recommend spending time in natural sunlight to stimulate the pineal gland. The gland is sensitive to light, and natural sunlight can help regulate its functions, including melatonin production. Herbs like mugwort, gotu cola, and ginkgo biloba are often cited as natural remedies that can help decalcify the pineal gland. Always consult a healthcare provider before beginning any herbal treatment. Certain frequencies and vibrations, such as those produced by singing bowls or chanting, are believed to stimulate the pineal gland. This is more rooted in spiritual traditions than scientific research, but is practiced by many. Physical activity increases blood flow throughout the body, including the brain, which could potentially aid in the process of decalcification. The experience of decalcifying the pineal gland and opening the third eye is subjective and can vary from person to person. However, many people who engage in practices aimed at achieving this report a range of mental, emotional, and spiritual changes. Here are some of the commonly reported feelings and experiences. Since the pineal gland produces melatonin, decalcifying it may lead to better sleep patterns and improved quality of sleep. You might find it easier to fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up feeling refreshed. The third eye is often linked to intuition and heightened awareness. After decalcification, you might find yourself more in tune with your surroundings and better at picking up on subtle cues. Many people report that they experience a surge in creativity, finding it easier to think outside the box and come up with new ideas. Improved mental clarity and focus are often cited benefits. Tasks may seem easier and you might find that you're more efficient and effective in your work and daily activities. Some people experience better mood and emotional stability, possibly due to the gland's role in regulating serotonin and melatonin, which impact mood. Increased intuition and clarity can lead to a deepening of spiritual practices and insights. Some people report experiencing more profound meditations, a stronger connection to a higher power, or increased synchronicities in their lives. It's common to hear reports of enhanced sensory experiences Colors may seem more vivid, sounds more clear, and touch more sensitive. Many individuals note a significant reduction in stress and anxiety levels, possibly due to improved hormone regulation and increased feelings of connectedness and awareness. While less commonly discussed, some people also report feeling physically healthier, attributing this to the gland's role in regulating various bodily functions with heightened intuition and emotional balance, you may find that your perspective on various aspects of life starts to shift. You may experience greater empathy, understanding, and a sense of interconnectedness with all life forms. Many describe the experience as a form of awakening, where they feel more alive and more in tune with the universe. Sound therapy, often using instruments like singing bowls or vocal chanting, has long been thought to stimulate the pineal gland and help open the third eye. This idea is deeply embedded in spiritual and esoteric traditions, although scientific research on the topic is limited. The underlying concept is that the pineal gland has its natural frequency and exposing it to external sounds that resonate at or near this frequency can activate it. When harmonic vibrations are introduced through sound, they bring a sense of balance and harmony to the body. This balancing effect is thought to extend to the pineal gland, potentially helping in its decalcification and activation. In a way, the brain itself tunes into these vibrations. Different frequencies can induce different brainwave states, alpha for relaxation, beta for alertness, and theta for deep meditation. It's particularly the theta state that has been linked with encouraging the pineal gland to become more active, leading to enhanced states of intuition and insight. These vibrations also lead to increased blood flow to the brain which could aid in removing calcification deposits from the pineal gland. The stress-reducing nature of sound therapy can further impact the gland positively, 
by reducing hormones that might inhibit its function. In a deeply relaxed state, individuals can connect spiritually with their inner selves and the universe at large. This form of connection is thought to stimulate the third eye, making it more receptive to higher forms of knowledge and wisdom. Additionally, heightens perception and understanding of oneself and the environment are commonly reported after sound therapy. People describe an increase in intuitive thought, deeper insights, and even foresight, which are often attributed to the activation of the third eye. In some cases, the vibrations are said to induce altered states of consciousness, facilitating experiences like lucid dreaming or deep meditative states. These altered states have been traditionally associated with an activated third eye. Ancient spiritual traditions, including Hinduism and Buddhism, have used chanting and sounds as tools for spiritual awakening for millennia. In these practices, sound is considered a direct path to attune the body's vibration with that of the universe, thereby facilitating the opening of the third eye. The concept of brainwave states is intriguing, especially when considering their role in accessing and programming the subconscious mind. Delta waves, ranging from 0.5 to 4 Hz, are the slowest brainwave frequencies are generally linked to deep, dreamless sleep. It's thought that during this state, the subconscious mind is highly active in processing the day's experiences and forming memories. Some believe this is a crucial time for subconscious programming where deeply held beliefs and patterns are either reinforced or modified. Theta waves range from 4 to 8 Hz, which are common during deep meditation and the early stages of sleep, are of particular interest in the context of the subconscious mind. This is often described as the twilight state, just between being awake and asleep. In this state, you are thought to have easier access to the subconscious mind and are more susceptible to new programs. Many practitioners of hypnotherapy aim to induce a theta state in their clients to suggest positive changes, whether that's quitting smoking or overcoming a fear. Theta is seen as the gateway to learning and memory. Thus, new beliefs can be more easily ingrained during this state. Stay with me because later I will share a powerful technique to reprogram your subconscious mind. Alpha waves are associated with a relaxed but alert state of mind and are often considered the bridge between the conscious and the subconscious. During activities like light meditation or even daydreaming, alpha waves dominate. This state allows for the crosstalk between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, making it a good time for affirmations and positive self-talk. In fact, many visualization exercises are designed to put you in an alpha state where you're relaxed enough to let your subconscious mind take over. Beta waves dominate our waking state and are associated with logical thinking and critical reasoning. While this state is necessary for daily functioning, it's not the optimal state for programming the subconscious mind. That's because the critical filter of the conscious mind, which often rejects ideas that are not in line with current beliefs, is active during this state. How can an infant, a young kid, learn these rules? They can't go to school, they can't read the book and all that. And I say, you don't have to. Nature provided theta hypnosis so that they can observe the parents, the family, and the community. Just observe their behavior and download those as programs. Age seven, then that's when they start to become more conscious and engaging themselves. So the first seven years is programming, and then after that, uh, we play, actually, unfortunately, 5% of our life from our creative conscious mind, 95% from the program. 400 years, the Jesuits have told their followers, give me a child until it is seven, and I will show you the man. Mm -hmm. And what they knew is exactly what we just said. First seven years is programming, but after age seven, 95% of your life is coming from that program. So if you can program the child for the first seven years, then the rest of the life of that child is actually an expression of that program. The notion that children primarily operate in the theta brainwave state the first seven years of life has gained considerable attention. 
particularly in psychology and neuroscience. This theta state is often associated with heightened plasticity or adaptability, providing a fertile ground subconscious programming. It's during these formative years that many of our core beliefs, habits and worldviews are filmed in this theta dominant state. Children are like sponges, absorbing the beliefs, attitudes, and cultural norms of their environment. They're more open to influence and learn rapidly from observing and mimicking adults and other children. Because the conscious, logical part of their brain hasn't fully developed, they are less able to critically analyze or question the information they receive. In essence, the critical filter that adults possess is virtually absent in young children, making them more suggestible and open to programming. This makes early childhood a critical period for the establishment of foundational subconscious programs. Parents, caregivers and early educational experiences play a significant role in this subconscious programming. Everything from a child's self-esteem to their understanding of the world and their place in it can be shaped during this time. Emotional experiences are particularly potent in creating long-lasting imprints as emotions often serve as a tag that signals the brain to pay attention and remember. It's not only overt teaching that impacts a child during these years, but also the implicit messages received from the environment. Children are keen observers of emotional nuances and nonverbal cues, so even things left unsaid or unexplained can deeply impact their subconscious programming. Identifying the limiting beliefs or bad programs in your subconscious mind can be crucial for personal growth and transformation. One practical way to pinpoint these problematic patterns is to consider the areas in your life where you're facing challenges or struggles. The things that come into your life that you like, they come into your life because you have a program to accept them. But those things that we want and we work hard and we sweat over and put a lot of effort, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make this happen, I'm working on it, I'm working real hard. Why are you working so hard? And the answer is not because the universe won't give it to you, it's because unconsciously your program does not support that destination and you're trying to override it with extra work and effort. So then life becomes a job more or less trying to get those things you want when your program unconsciously is sabotaging you. These struggles often act as signposts pointing towards the underlying beliefs that might be holding you back. For instance, if you find that you're consistently struggling financially, it might be an indication of subconscious beliefs around money. Perhaps you were raised to think that money is the root of all evil or that you don't deserve to be wealthy. Similarly, if you find that you're having trouble maintaining healthy relationships, you might be harboring subconscious beliefs about your worthiness of love or the trustworthiness of others. But there's a way to replace those bad programs with good ones. According to Dr. Bruce Lipton, the moments just before falling asleep and right upon waking up are opportune times to reprogram your subconscious mind. During these times, you're naturally in a theta brainwave state, which is the same state where subconscious programming occurs most effectively. Dr. Lipton explains that in this theta state, your subconscious mind is in recording mode rather than playing mode making it more receptive to new information and beliefs. The significance of this is profound. Instead of operating on autopilot with ingrained beliefs and habits, you have a window of time to intentionally feed your subconscious mind with thoughts and ideas that serve you better. This can be particularly useful for those looking to break free from limiting beliefs, addictions, or negative thought patterns. Listening to an audio program before you sleep or write when you wake up can be a highly effective method for reprogramming your subconscious mind. Audio programs designed for this purpose often employ a range of techniques aimed at subconscious reprogramming. These programs are created by experts using different methods. A long time ago, after extensive research, I discovered a platform that offers powerful audio programs specifically designed for subconscious reprogramming. They offer a wide range of programs like you see in this image. I'll put a link in the description below. To maximize effectiveness, choose an audio program that aligns closely with your specific goals or desired changes. Make it a daily practice to listen either before sleep or upon waking, or even better, both. By consistently employing this strategy, you harness the natural characteristics of the theta state 
to reprogram your subconscious mind more effectively.